The Chernobyl disaster, a nuclear catastrophe that unfolded in 1986, left behind a trail of devastation. But within the wreckage, a remarkable story emerged, a story of human resilience, technological innovation, and the unexpected heroes who rose to the challenge. In this exploration, we will uncover the individuals and machines that played crucial roles in containing the disaster. But before we get started, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to click subscribe button. MY26 Helicopters In the immediate aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster, as the world watched in horror, a new and equally terrifying battle began, one against an invisible, insidious enemy, radiation. Among the unsung heroes of this battle were the crews of the MI-26's helicopters. These monstrous machines flew into the heart of the radioactive maelstrom, tasked with decontaminating the irradiated landscape and containing the nuclear threat. The MI-26, the heaviest and most powerful helicopter ever to be put into serial production, was originally designed for military use. Intended to transport heavy equipment such as armored vehicles and missile systems to remote areas, it found itself repurposed for a grim new mission in the summer of 1986, spraying a sticky polymeric substance known as PIBMA over the contaminated soil of Chernobyl. PIBMA, a dark, viscous mixture, was developed to bind radioactive dust to the ground, preventing it from being carried by the wind and spreading further contamination. The MI-26's specially modified version was equipped with four additional tanks holding over 14,000 litres of this substance. From heights of just 60 to 70 metres, the MI-26's would fly at speeds of 50 to 60 kilometres per hour, their under-fuselage sprayers creating a 12-metre-wide swath of the sticky film. The work was gruelling and dangerous, requiring up to 30 passes over the same area to achieve the necessary coverage. On June 25, 1986, the first MY-26 took to the skies over Chernobyl. Its crew was fully aware of the lethal radiation that permeated the air, despite the protective screens installed in the cockpit and the filter system designed to shield them from the worst of the exposure. Each flight was a perilous gamble. The helicopter's massive rotors churned up radioactive dust with every pass, and even with lead plates lining the cockpit floor, the crew could not escape the relentless bombardment of gamma rays. In addition to spraying PIBMA, MI-26 also served in critical operations to install large objects on the roofs of the remaining power units. In one particularly tense mission, an MI-26 was tasked with placing a dome-shaped lid urgently manufactured to cover the exposed reactor. The conditions were so extreme that after each mission, the helicopters had to be thoroughly decontaminated at makeshift field stations. Even so, the MI-26 became so radioactive that some were deemed too dangerous to continue flying. These helicopters, having served their purpose, were sent to the helicopter graveyard in Russia, a desolate field where irradiated machinery was abandoned to rust away. Witnessing the immense challenges faced by the crews flying the MI-26 during the Chernobyl cleanup, we are reminded of the incredible sacrifices made by these unsung heroes in their battle against an invisible enemy. Their courage and dedication helped to contain the spread of radiation and prevent further disaster. Barrage Balloons Amidst the desolation of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, strange shapes hovered in the sky. By day, they were barely visible against the grey Ukrainian sky, but as night fell, they transformed into ghostly orbs, casting an eerie glow over the landscape. These were no ordinary balloons. They were relics of a bygone war, repurposed to aid in one of the most desperate engineering feats of the 20th century the construction of the sarcophagus over Reactor 4. It was a Herculean effort, requiring thousands of workers, known as liquidators, to brave lethal levels of radiation. The urgency of the situation meant that work had to be done around the clock, including at night. Adequate lighting became a critical task, and these holdovers from World War II were tasked with providing it. Initially designed to deter enemy aircraft, Barrage balloons were typically filled with hydrogen and tethered to the ground by steel cables around critical infrastructure. The idea was simple. By raising these balloons to certain heights, they created a deadly obstacle for low-flying aircraft, forcing them to fly higher and into the range of anti-aircraft guns. These same balloons now found a new life at Chernobyl. 
Filled with over 2,000 cubic meters of helium, the balloons were tethered around the construction site of the sarcophagus and connected to power generators. Attached to them were 40 kilowatt lamps, powerful enough to pierce the thick radioactive dust that hung in the air. The liquidators, with a grim sense of humor, nicknamed them lustras or chandeliers. The work they illuminated was grueling. High radiation levels meant that direct interaction with the sarcophagus components was nearly impossible. Much of the construction had to be done remotely with robots and cranes. Yet, even in these extreme conditions, the balloons floated silently above the 24-hour construction schedule, allowing the sarcophagus to be built in just 206 days. Under conditions that defied belief, the sarcophagus encased 200 tons of radioactive corium, 30 tons of highly contaminated dust, and 16 tons of uranium and plutonium. As for the balloons, their role, though fleeting, was vital. Once the construction was complete, these floating chandeliers, having absorbed dangerous levels of radiation, were unceremoniously buried, like so much of the contaminated debris from Chernobyl. The Toy Tank of Chernobyl In the chaos and devastation of the Chernobyl disaster, an unexpected hero emerged. It wasn't clad in a lead-lined suit, nor was it a cutting-edge piece of Soviet engineering. It was a small plastic toy tank, purchased from a children's store in Kiev. This humble machine would become the first functional robot in the deadly environment of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. As the disaster unfolded, the Soviet Union scrambled to contain the catastrophe, deploying its brightest minds and most advanced technologies. Among them was Alexander Barvoy, an atomic physicist from the Kurchatov Institute in Moscow. Arriving at the disaster site on April 29th, he was tasked with helping to measure and control the release of lethal radioactive materials. Robotics engineers, initially hailed as heroes of Chernobyl in the press, faced devastating setbacks. The advanced robots designed to traverse the reactor's irradiated corridors quickly succumbed to the intense radiation. In one failed attempt, a robot became stuck on a minor obstacle, a metal tube no more than five inches in diameter. Two workers risked their lives to lift the robot over the tube, only for it to malfunction, roll down the wrong corridor, and topple over for a final time. Witnessing these failures, Barvoy and his colleagues knew they needed a different approach, something simpler, more resilient. During a trip to Kiev, a colleague stumbled upon a toy tank in a store called Everything for Children. Priced at just 12 rubles, about $5, the tank was a far cry from the sophisticated machinery the team had been relying on. Yet, its simplicity proved to be its greatest strength. The toy was quickly adapted for its new mission. Its short cable was replaced with a longer 10-meter multi-channel cable, and it was outfitted with a decimeter, a thermometer, and a strong flashlight in place of the gun barrel. This rudimentary robot could now navigate around the debris-strewn corridors of the reactor, providing crucial data from areas too dangerous for humans to enter. Barvoy described the tank as an extraordinary hunting dog, leading the way through the radioactive ruins. For nearly a year, from 1986 until the spring of 1987, the tank operated reliably until it became too contaminated and was buried in the radioactive rubble. Reflecting on this unlikely hero, Barvoy later wrote a simple acknowledgement in his memoirs. Thank you, small tank. The Moonwalker Among the many robots used in the Chernobyl cleanup, the STR-1, known to many as the Moonwalker, had perhaps the most interesting backstory. This specialized transport robot was a direct descendant of the Lunacod lunar rovers, which had traversed the surface of the moon during the early 1970s. Lunacod 1, launched in 1970, was the first remote-controlled robot to land on another celestial body. It travelled over 10 kilometres, sent back thousands of images, and conducted scientific experiments that provided invaluable data about the Moon. Its successor, Lunacod 2, pushed even further, setting records for extraterrestrial distance travel that would stand for decades. In the aftermath of Chernobyl, Soviet engineers, drawing on the experience gained from the Lunacod programme, adapted the technology to meet the dire needs of the disaster site. The result was the STR-1, a robust machine capable of withstanding the extreme radiation levels that far exceeded anything the Lunacods had encountered on the Moon. 
the robot was designed to clear debris, remove highly radioactive materials, and perform tasks too dangerous for human workers. Constructed in less than two months, the STR-1 was engineered to withstand exposure to gamma radiation levels that would be lethal to humans within minutes. Its electronic circuits were encased in a lead-shielded container, and its cameras were fitted with radiation-resistant glass, allowing it to operate in conditions that would be deadly to humans. The robot's titanium and alloy frame was coated with radiation-resistant paint, and its hermetically sealed wheels, equipped with individual electromechanical actuators and independent suspension, enabled it to navigate the debris-strewn terrain of the reactor's roof with remarkable maneuverability. To ensure the STR-1 could endure the harsh environment, engineers implemented several protective features, including sealed electrical connections, relays, contactors, and radiation-resistant lubricants in the traction drives. The STR-1 was first deployed on the roof of Chernobyl's Reactor No. 3 in August 1986. It faced a daunting task. The roof was covered in graphite blocks, fuel rods, and other debris, all emitting lethal doses of radiation. The robot's job was to push this material off the roof, where it could be safely collected and buried. Operators guided it remotely from a safe distance using video feeds from the robot's onboard cameras. However, the environment at Chernobyl was unforgiving. Radiation levels on the roof reached as high as 10,000 roentgens per hour, far beyond what the STR-1's components had been designed to handle. Despite its rugged construction, the robot began to experience failures. Its electronic circuits, shielded by lead and encased in radiation-resistant materials, were slowly being fried by the relentless bombardment of gamma rays. Yet, in its short operational life, the STR-1 accomplished much. It removed over 90 tons of radioactive debris, work that would have otherwise required the exposure of up to 1,000 human workers. The Red Mercedes On the night of April 25, 1986, a red Mercedes-Benz truck idled silently beneath the steel canopy of Chernobyl's turbine hall. This was no ordinary vehicle, it was a mobile vibration lab, packed with state-of-the-art diagnostic tools and mounted on the sturdy chassis of a Mercedes-Benz LK or LM truck from West Germany. Acquired by the plant in late 1985, the lab, designed by the Swiss firm Vibrometer, analyzed the most minute tremors within the rotors and bearings of turbines. Earlier that day, it had been driven into the heart of Reactor 4's operations at the request of the plant's chief engineer. Turbine units 7 and 8 of Reactor 4 were experiencing unsatisfactory vibrations, and the scheduled maintenance shutdown provided the opportunity for measurements. But as midnight passed, the routine turned into a nightmare. With their Mercedes-Benz lab stationed between the problematic turbines, three engineers from the plant, Vladimir Savanov, Georgi Papov, and Alexander Kabanov began their tests. As they worked, the reactor that powered these turbines was being gradually shut down according to the Ministry of Energy's schedule. Then, without warning, something went horribly wrong. At 12.30 a.m., a catastrophic explosion ripped through Reactor 4. The force of the blast shattered the turbine hall, collapsing the roof and nearly burying the lab under a mountain of debris. Radiation levels soared to lethal heights. Yet amidst the chaos, the engineers did not flee. Instead, they joined the plant's operational staff in an effort to prevent further explosions and contain the fire. It was a valiant, if ultimately futile, attempt to save not only their vehicle, but also the lives of those still inside the plant. Savanov, the first to show symptoms of radiation sickness, was led out by Papov and Kabanov. They joined others in an evacuation that tragically exposed them to even more radiation. By the time they were airlifted to Moscow's 6th Clinical Hospital, the diagnosis was grim. Savanov and Papov had contracted acute radiation sickness of the most severe degree. Kabanov's condition, though serious, was slightly less dire. Vladimir Savanov succumbed to radiation sickness on May 21st. He was buried in Kiev, his body encased in a lead coffin. Georgi Papov followed on June 13th and was laid to rest among other Chernobyl victims at Mitino Cemetery in Moscow. Kabanov, though severely affected, managed to survive, returning to Kiev with permanent disabilities. A large group of plant workers attended Papov's funeral. 
During the memorial service, the chief designer announced that once recovered and decontaminated, the Vibration Lab would be named in honor of the young men who sacrificed their lives trying to save it. In 1987, the Mercedes-Benz Lab, the focus of their final efforts, was finally extracted from the rubble. However, due to severe contamination, it was deemed unsalvageable and was buried in an unknown location. In the years that followed, the story of the engineers and their ill-fated mission was largely forgotten, lost in the shadows of larger narratives. It wasn't until decades later that their names, Savanov, Papov, and Kabanov, were finally honored. They were posthumously awarded the Order for Courage by the Ukrainian government. That's all for today. As we reflect on the events of Chernobyl, let us remember the sacrifices made by those who risked their lives to prevent further catastrophe. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe for more fascinating stories from the past and present.